you tell. The special report that follows is a story that started back in January of 1972, when Geraldo Rivera and other reporters from other television stations and newspapers first discovered the dismal quality of the care and treatment this state provides for its mentally retarded people. The special report tells the story of the changes that have been made since 1972 and of the changes that have still to be made. The French have an expression, plus ça change, plus c'est la même chose. The more things change, the more they stay the same. Never has the expression been more appropriate than it is now. This is the Willowbrook case. Geraldo Rivera reporting. This building in Brooklyn houses the Eastern District Federal Courthouse. And this room on the sixth floor for the last several months has echoed with a frightening recital of horrors. Federal Judge Oren Judd has been hearing testimony on the case against the New York State Department of Mental Hygiene. To the people who've given testimony in this courtroom, this unprecedented federal lawsuit is known simply as the Willowbrook case, because it specifically concerns that warehouse of human misery on Staten Island. This court is hearing the story for the first time, but it's an old story, and a story that goes even beyond the locked wards at Willowbrook and beyond the case that's being argued here. And tonight we tell that larger story, our version of the Willowbrook case, the people against the state of New York. <laughs> Robert Kennedy went to Willowbrook in 1965, almost 10 years ago. He found a snake pit and he demanded change, but there would be no change. We submit what he found as our Exhibit A, our first piece of evidence in the case against the state of New York. When I visited the state institutions for the mentally retarded, and I think particularly at Willowbrook that we have a situation that borders on a snake pit and that the children live in filth. Uh, but uh, many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. In 1972, we went to Willowbrook for the first time. These are the conditions we found. This is our Exhibit B. The first building we went into was number six, the B Ward, and I was totally unprepared for what we found there. In the large bare room, there was one attendant and perhaps 50 or 60 seriously and profoundly retarded young boys. Many of them were naked, some were smeared with their own feces, all were just rocking back and forth or smashing their heads against the floor and walls. This institution in 1972 was a crime against humanity. Those aren't just words, they accurately reflect the reality of Willowbrook. It was a horrible place that New York State officials could neither defend nor explain away. Since that time, however, some significant improvements have been implemented, and this documentary, among other things, is a follow-up on what has or has not been done. Willowbrook, as it was in November of this year, is our Exhibit C in this case against the state. Under the crushing pressure of public outrage, the Department of Mental Hygiene increased the institution's budget and added 300 staff people. It also took action to decrease the number of residents at Willowbrook, reducing the total population from five to about 3,000. But despite these improvements, the expert witnesses in the federal lawsuit testified that conditions for people who remained at the institution were as bad and in some cases were worse than they had been before the initial newspaper and television exposés, a fact indicative of either supreme incompetence or grossly misplaced priorities on the part of state officials. Under the heading of Exhibit D, we present some of the specific evidence of insufficient change. It deals mostly with the physical abuse or neglect of the residents, but is not meant as a reflection on the employees at the institution, most of whom are dedicated, underpaid, and working under impossible conditions. There have been several complaints from parents of apparently battered children. How much more can he take? <laughs> he can't speak to himself. I have to talk for him. <laughs> In October, an 18-year-old resident of Building 8 was found lying in a pool of blood next to his bed. Nobody saw what happened to him, but the night attendant quickly called for a doctor. At night, there's only one doctor on duty to care for all 3,000 residents. According to witnesses, it took the doctor 20 minutes to get from Building 2 to Building 8, a distance of about 200 yards. By that time, the resident was dead. This summer, another retarded child broke a leg. He was taken from Willowbrook to the public service hospital on Staten Island where a cast was put on. The child was then taken back to this ward at Willowbrook to recuperate. 
When he was returned to the public health hospital to have the cast removed three months later, the nurses there were horrified to discover that the cast had been rotted by the boy's own urine. When the cast was finally removed, it was found to be infested with maggots. By the time we, the maggots were found, uh, it was too late because we did not get any answer from the public health hospital as to what to be done, and we immediately had them removed. But we certainly do admit that uh, it should have been corrected, yes. There are no screens on the windows of Willowbrook's hospital ward, so the limbs of crippled children are inviting resting and feeding grounds for flies. And open sores like this one, not really explained, have been seen too frequently in this place. I said earlier that about 2,000 residents have been taken out of Willowbrook. Good news, but where have they gone? While some have been placed in wonderful community facilities like those run by Catholic Charities and the Association for Retarded Children, the majority have just been shifted to other substandard institutions. Operation Exodus, the program to reduce the population of Willowbrook, is a failure because many of the former residents, like those taken here to Keener on Ward's Island, are worse off now than they were before they left Willowbrook. The Department of Mental Hygiene has the responsibility for caring also for the state's mentally ill as well as its retarded. And the department's record in this area leaves just as much to be desired. Pilgrim State is the world's largest institution devoted to the care of the mentally ill. Located out in Suffolk County, the complex of buildings is enormous. The wards are fairly clean now, but they're also depressingly familiar. They're filled with men and women doing nothing, going nowhere, waiting for nothing to happen. During the mid-60s, Pilgrim State, along with Kings Park, Central Islip, and other state institutions for the mentally ill, were the target of scandal and expose. They were branded human warehouses that were totally unresponsive, failing to provide either decent living conditions or rehabilitation for their residents. The critics said that the best way to care for the mentally handicapped was outside these big institutions and in the community. The state responded to the criticism with panic. They started almost indiscriminately to discharge patients. So many were set free that it permitted state officials to close down entire buildings, not only at Pilgrim State, but at Kings Park and at Central Islip as well. There are now dozens of structurally sound abandoned buildings on Department of Mental Hygiene property. This is Pilgrim State Hospital, and it's too bad it isn't Halloween because this is absolutely the spookiest place I've ever been. Behind me is what must have been one of the biggest buildings ever built on Long Island. It was put up in the early 40s. Actually, this place is like a little town. The big central building in the middle, the little church in the foreground, and lots of smaller buildings, satellites actually, to every side of it. All of them are empty. It's eerie here. It's like a ghost town. You wonder where all the people went. The answer to that question is our Exhibit H. It's called Dumping. This is Main Street in the town of Bayshore, Long Island. Until recently, this was a pleasant, quiet suburban community. Its misfortune, though, is that it's located within a few miles of the big institutions. Because, as you can see, shuffling along the street at every hour of the day or night, improperly dressed, unsupervised, and uncared for are dozens and dozens of former mental patients. In an indefensible perversion of the concept of community care, the state just put these people out, with little or no preparation, with little or no provision for aftercare or supervision or psychiatric follow-up, they were dumped out on the streets. A whole new business was created by the emptying of the institutions for the mentally ill, providing housing for former residents. Some of the community facilities are decent and well-maintained. Most are not. The dismal Baybright Hotel, where a majority of the residents are former mental patients, is an example. Until October, there were no rehabilitative programs here at all, and now they're only minimal. Two men share one room. I asked the hotel manager about it. Lance, what rent does he pay here? Pete uh, pays 125 per month. And the other roommate also 125. Right. So that means for this room they pay 250 a month. Yes. Don't you think that's high for a room that's maybe what is this? Eight by ten and two people, 250 a month, and that's without food, right? That is without food, right? That's room and room by itself. With 250 a month, they could live in a whole house. Don't you I think don't that's kind of high? No, I don't. I don't. That's, that's the going rate. In Wyandanche, also in Suffolk County, there's a rundown frame house that's been rented to three former mental patients. It demonstrates how badly the state has failed in the area of community care. This slum is owned and operated by an employee of the Department of Mental Hygiene, a residential therapist at Pilgrim State. 
The three residents of this house, all of whom were discharged from Pilgrim State, are charged a total of $420 a month rent for the privilege of living here. My guy was Richard Balland, a social worker. The health department was notified, and uh, they did contact uh, the landlord, Mr. Powell. So he seems to be making some uh, slight attempts, but uh, the place you can see is still uh, well, disgusting. And uh, I'm aware of the fact that Mr. Powell is pulling in some uh, $420 a month rent for this place, every 28 days, that is. Mr. Powell was given the opportunity to come on and give his side of the story, but he chose not to. Long Beach in Nassau County is another community that suffered as a result of dumping. It used to be an attractive beachside resort, but the city had the misfortune of having an excess of hotels with empty rooms in the off-season. Enterprising owners got together with state officials and large numbers of former mental patients were shuttled in. One of the largest hotels on the boardwalk is the Promenade, where the normal elderly with their very different needs are now housed side by side with the mentally handicapped. My tour guide was Long Beach resident Joe French. The problem is that they're here and you can see they just sit. There's no programs for their, for their entertainment, for their diet, for their care, for their well-being, dress. And, and that's the thing the people in Long Beach are concerned about is that it may have been a great program to turn people loose out of, the, uh, out of these big institutions, but they just moved them from one institution to another where they get less care than they got in, in the institution that they were first in. Do you want to tell me the story of the mental patient who was found dead after, well, I guess an extended period of time? Yeah, I guess what happened is they, that seventh floor, the top floor of the hotel was closed off and not used anymore. And all of the elevators don't run there except there is one that runs to that floor. She must have wanted onto that elevator, went to the top floor and no one ever goes up there. And then she, we don't know what happened, how she died, but she, she died up there and she laid there for several months. No one went up there, so no one found it until some workmen happened to go up there one day. I spoke with two residents of another establishment catering primarily to released mental patients, the Miami Hotel. Do they take care of you now? No, no, no. no do Nothing happened. Not they don't do anything worse. They're waiting for us. They don't come and help you out or take care of you? No, they don't help us. They don't do anything worse. The truth, they don't do anything worse. Well, there's a feeling of indignation at the State Department of Mental Hygiene at its poorly developed and improperly conceived uh, program of releasing mental patients. It's thrust large numbers of people into Long Beach without proper aftercare. Uh, it's placed an undue burden on the community, and it's certainly totally unfair to the former patients themselves. The Upper West Side of Manhattan is another area with more than its share of dumped mental patients, and again, there's a logical reason. In this case, it's the proliferation of sleazy single-room occupancy hotels perhaps the sleaziest of which is the West Side Towers on Broadway, where living conditions like this are common. The occupant of this room, a released mental patient, ran in fear when we knocked on his door. There's a person living, lives in this room. Dr. Henry Brill of the Department of Mental Hygiene responds. The uh, operation has not been fully successful. With hindsight, it's apparent now that we could have done it differently under the pressures of the, that existed at the time. Legal pressures, that is the pressure of laws, regulations, public opinion, uh, professional enthusiasm. Uh, I'm not sure that how it could have been done differently, but if I had it to do over again, I would uh, feel that we could have done it differently. Most people getting out of mental institutions need welfare benefits to survive. That's an unavoidable fact of life. The big political question, though, is who pays the welfare bill? the original county of residence, or the county the former mental patient moves into after he or she is released from an institution. This internal memorandum and others obtained for us by the independent study group from the records of the Department of Mental Hygiene are clear and to us convincing evidence that under pressure from Suffolk County officials who are angry of the dumping of residents into towns like Bay Shore, the department unlawfully contrived to prevent patients released in Suffolk from getting assistance from that county. Brendan Bushy of the study group explains. These people were cut off from the state and the county. They were denied resources at the welfare department and they were denied resources at the hospital. It meant that they had to go to really bad places to live and some of them had to wander around because they had no place to live. 
A lot of people were found wandering in the streets, and there were a lot of horrible situations which developed here in Suffolk County. And the people of Suffolk County are now mad, and they're focusing their anger on the patients rather than on the administration where it belongs. The State Welfare Inspector General's Office has announced an investigation to determine whether or not the Department of Mental Hygiene has been guilty of welfare fraud. This case against the Department of Mental Hygiene continues in one minute. From the air, the Oswald D. Heck Developmental Center looks a lot like a small community college. Actually, there's nothing very small about it. When it was first designed in 1965, it was thought to be a very, very progressive approach to dealing with the problems of the mentally retarded. Instead of one big building, they subdivided it and made it many smaller buildings. But by 1969, 1970, when it came time to break ground there, just about everybody in the state realized that the idea of institutionalized care for the retarded was a bankrupt idea. Many people urged them to change the plans, to alter it, to make Oswald D. Heck something other than it was designed originally to be. The State Department of Mental Hygiene, though, thought it was too late. The cost of this project was about $25 million, but although it has a capacity of over 500 beds, the big complex remains almost empty. The place is empty because it never should have been built. Even the director of the school, Dr. Hugh Lefebvre, admits that a large institution was not what the retarded needed. Uh, the dilemma is that, uh, that you have a large complex here uh, that, uh, that, that's centralized, whereas it we're in a point where we're doing everything that we humanly can to decentralize programs and bring them as close to the people as we can. Five years ago, before ground had even been broken up in Schenectady, the state issued this study. In it, the department admitted that at least one-third of all people inside its institutions for the retarded, that's a total of about 8,000 people, could be better cared for in neighborhood-based, smaller, more humane, and far less expensive halfway houses, if those facilities had been available, but they weren't. And the bitter fact is that the halfway houses could have been built because the department had the necessary funds. Ten years ago, a bond issue of over a billion dollars had been approved specifically to build appropriate facilities for the mentally handicapped. With the money in hand, the department had two choices, either to build the necessary neighborhood homes or to put up more of the huge Willowbrook-like institutions. These empty rooms in the Oswald D. Hecht School stand in silent testimony to the decision that was made. A couple of hundred million in taxpayers' dollars has been spent since 1965 to build more of the large, already outmoded institutions, while only one-tenth that amount has been spent during that period on residential homes. It all seems so illogical. I asked Joseph Weingold, the chairman of the State Association for Retarded Children, if he knew why the state had built the new institutions. Now, I don't know what the motivation is, Suddenly they're making jobs for people who are doing buildings, you know. But I don't think the mentally retarded should be there to make jobs for people who are going to build buildings. I think they're there because they need a, uh, because they've been afflicted, they're unfortunate, they're helpless, and uh, we owe them a duty to help them, as we do all helpless people. Uh, they went ahead and they built the institutions. Uh, mounting costs uh, made them almost prohibitive, $100,000 a bed when all the time they could have community alternatives for a tenth of that. It's important to point out that Oswald Heck isn't the only institution that the state decided to build. There were seven in all. They were started within the last five years. Wilton School near Albany started in 1969, designed to hold about 500 beds at a cost of $23.5 million. The Syracuse State School also started in 1969, designed to hold 744 beds at a cost of about 21 million. The Kings County State School, now called Developmental Center, started in 1970, is designed to hold 744 beds at a cost of 28 million. The Broom State School, also finished but virtually empty, is designed to hold 500 beds at a cost of about 17 million. In Dickinson, New York, the Monroe State School, begun in 1971, will hold 500 beds at a cost of about $18 million. And finally, the Bronx State School, still under construction. It will hold 384 beds and will cost $24.3 million. All of these estimated tens of millions don't figure in the interest costs, which over the payback period will double the initial price of these institutions. Your money has been squandered. 
New Hope, a residential home in Brooklyn that's recently been opened by the Lutheran Community Services Organization and the Wall Street Charity Fund, is an example of how the money should have been spent. There are 11 retarded boys and girls living here. They go to school, they get personal attention and care on a one-to-one -one basis. And the ironic thing is that this kind of treatment costs only about half as much as it does to keep a child in an institution like Willowbrook. Look around. You don't have to be an expert in the field of the mentally handicapped to realize that this way is the better way. You just have to be a reasonable person. The Department of Mental Hygiene had hundreds of millions to spend on model halfway homes like New Hope. Instead, it built the seven new mini Willowbrooks. Accountability for that misplaced priority and those misspent millions, we think, lies at the door of the commissioner, Dr. Alan Miller. We tried to interview him for this special, but in this letter dated November 19th, he refused to talk to us, citing the pressures of department business. Earlier in the month, on the eve of the elections, we asked the two candidates for governor for their views on the continued use of state mental hygiene monies for huge state schools. On November 1st, you, Carey, responded with this pledge. Frankly, I think the first visit that I'd like to make with you uh, after I become governor, if I'm elected, <coughs> within a, uh, a week's time, uh, is to Willowbrook and go there and uh, stay there until you and I agree with the, uh, those who are managing Willowbrook who seem to want to do a good job, what we have to do, and stop talking about Willowbrook and get something done. Governor Wilson was more difficult to pin down. After three refusals for an interview, we finally tracked down the governor on the night before elections at LaGuardia Airport. He wasn't anxious to talk about the performance of the Department of Mental Hygiene. Governor, uh, for the last, actually, two and a half years, we've been doing a, a kind of continuing story about the performance of the Department of Mental well, Hygiene. I'll talk to you about that on Thursday or Friday. Are there any other questions about the election tomorrow? Governor, uh, because the Department of Mental Hygiene is one of the state's largest agencies and because its policies have affected so many people's lives, we pressed the governor to respond. The second time I asked the question, he ignored me completely. Don't you think, sir, that the performance of the Department of Mental Hygiene is a state issue? Are there any other questions having to do with uh, my trip today? But just two... Hugh Carey made good on his campaign pledge just two days ago. He began his visit at Building 9, which houses the severely and profoundly retarded. Outside, he met Bernard Carabello, a young man who spent 18 of his 23 years inside the wards of Willowbrook. He came back Tuesday to be our expert witness. It was overcrowded and undisturbed. And now I'm, I'm living in a park. On my own, I don't have nobody, nobody living with me, and I'm doing more for myself. That food, what could be done if there was like a one-to-one -one relation? That's that's all I need. One of the wards Mr. Carey then visited was the hospital in Building 2. There were still no screens on the windows, and the governor-elect swatted away flies that were buzzing and landing on the face of a patient whose hands were strapped down. If Willowbrook is ever going to be cleaned up, the first step will have to be a guilty plea by the state in the real Willowbrook case that's now pending against it in federal court. Governor Wilson has stubbornly refused to do that, but the historic importance of Tuesday's visit was Carrie's announcement that he'll enter that guilty plea when he takes office in January. Since I've seen what can be done in smaller residential care units, I'd like to see it depopulated and decreased in size to the minimum level of occupancy. This is Building 9 in Willowbrook, a more appropriate place to end our presentation of this case than a courtroom would have been. If this had been an actual trial, I would end with a closing statement, a summation for the judge and the jury. Well, tonight we ask that you at home be the judge and the jury. We've presented our evidence and we've also presented whatever explanation the Department of Mental Hygiene has made available to us. Based on that evidence, we ask now that you find the Department of Mental Hygiene guilty. Find them guilty of incompetence and neglect and mismanagement. And find them guilty also of abusing and violating the civil rights of the people they're supposed to be caring for. We ask that the sentence be handed down in three parts. First that the department phase out all its large institutions. Secondly, 
that the department be ordered to direct all its money and its priorities to the creation of a system of halfway houses for the mentally handicapped. And thirdly, that somebody be held responsible, made accountable for what's happened here at Pilgrim State and throughout the state. In that regard, we ask that all the top administrators of the Department of Mental Hygiene, including the commissioner, Dr. Alan Miller, be dismissed. Then and only then can the slogan, no more Willow Brooks, become a reality. Thank you and good night. It's unfortunate that it was 18 years before they discovered that you could do all these things, and you did a lot more for yourself. Well, yeah, right. it took a lot of, lot of work. All right. Well, you have a, still have a lot of life ahead of you. I, I hope.